The virtual CISO moment is brought to you by VCISO Services, a leading provider of quality and experienced virtual chief information security officers for small and mid-sized businesses. Check them out at vcisoservices.com. Hi, I'm Greg Schaefer, and welcome to the Virtual CISO Moment. I've got James Farley with me today. He is the Partner Development Manager for Cybersecurity at ConnectWise. James, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I'd like to hear a little bit about your background. I know we've known each other for, for some time now, but uh, tell us about how you got started in IT and how you got to where you're at today. Yeah, that's a great question. When I got out of school, I grew up in Chattanooga, uh, Tennessee. When I got out of school, I... Uh, I was in the insurance business and selling insurance for a short period of time. Um, and in 2003, uh, folks will remember, or maybe a little before then, uh, Dell opened a huge office here in Nashville. Yes. Uh, selling computer stuff. And I had the opportunity to come here, uh, join the sales team there. I was only there for a year. Uh, but it was through that, uh, through that time at Dell uh, that I met Sonny Clark, who was a guy that I've worked for. Uh, and with uh, multiple times in my career. Uh, but from there, I went and joined, joined uh, Advanced Network Solutions, which um, many years ago was one of the top uh, MSPs in the Nashville area. They've been since been acquired. But uh, that led to a uh, nearly 20-year-long uh, stint here of uh, being in the managed services IT industry, you know, outsourced IT services, and uh, obviously starting out. Uh, back then, the really hot things were like, Cisco voice over IP and uh, small business server and, uh, you know, moving people to uh, Microsoft Exchange, you know, that was a big deal. Anyway, so we did tons of that and uh, the industry developed and I continued to have sales roles and then moved on into uh, sales management. And then uh, I, I, yeah, I'd say in the last 10 years, um, and obviously part of how you and I came to know each other, uh, is I, I began to have a, uh, some knowledge about the, the banking industry and sort of the regulatory concerns and, and things related to IT there, uh, began to work with more financial institutions and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, while you were going through that history there, I can almost see my career kind of scrolling through my mind, you know, the Cisco and then the, uh, the, the, the exchange upgrades and installations and all that. And certainly I remember Dell that uh, they they built that whole facility or I don't know if they built or uh, but out by the airport I believe, yep. right? yeah wow well and and I do want to pause and just and just say since since you brought it up about how we first met um, one of the things that I was always very appreciative of is that you did reach out to me when I first started this virtual CISO business and there's a um, a lot of stuff in the beginning of starting a business is very difficult. It's a very scary time. And so I very much appreciate that you were there as part of my support chain. So thank you. Yeah, well, likewise, you know, in the last, uh, before I joined ConnectWise here uh, in January of this year, um, in 2016, uh, sort of my last foray in managed services, uh, in 2016, myself and some other uh, guys uh, and, and gals, uh, started Acumen Technology, and that was a security-focused MSP. I exited that in uh, December of last year uh, to do what I'm doing now. But uh, but I know we you know, we worked together a lot there, and uh, and really that was uh, that was a great time uh, because as you know now, financial institutions, especially small ones, uh, struggle to uh, have the resources and everything necessary to kind of meet all of the needs in the cybersecurity space. So what would you what would you say is a one of the top significant threats for either um, financial institutions or or just SMBs in general? I know this past week we've had like several come across the wire as far as like seems like several different ransomware stuff. And then there was the Microsoft um, Felina, if I remember correctly, correctly earlier in the week. And then just now in the last 24 hours, Confluence has a big zero day, apparently. So right. um, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, and, and and I see things obviously through the lens of of my professional experience, which has been in the managed services space. And so I think that there's most smaller organizations, if they don't outsource all of their IT, some of them do, uh, they're at least, uh, you know, depending on third party vendors for some significant components of what they do. Um, and from what I'm seeing, just to kind of take it to the highest level, <clears throat> I still see ransomware and business email compromise 
uh, being two of the biggest things. You know, you can zero in on these individual um, zero days, and, and all of those are very important. Um, but most small businesses, uh, especially those that outsource more functions of IT, they're not doing the very basic stuff really well. Patch management, vulnerability management, um, you know, uh, managing credentials for remote access and uh, administrative controls and multi-factor authentication for everything and, and those sorts of things. <clears throat> one of the, um, one of the go-to um, references, if you will, in, in the industry is the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. And they called that out, particularly with ransomware. I think they said that 18% um, increase year over year, and it's the largest increase in the last, um, in the last several years. So um, you have a very unique perspective, though, uh, being involved with MSPs. And, and I seem to recall that a few weeks ago, <clears throat> excuse me, CISA had sent uh, had released a memo about the increase in threats to MSPs. Do you have any any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I said that, that that's huge. And, um, you know, it's something that we all know. And that's part of when I joined ConnectWise, part of what was exciting to me about what I do now. I work with with generally large MSPs to help them build and implement uh, a successful cybersecurity program for their clients. Um, but I think that the entire world, and especially the bad guys, uh, they pick up on it first. You know, if you are outsourcing some component of your IT, um, it is just critically important to make sure uh, the vendor management aspect of that, you know, is, is uh, you'll see a lot of these MSPs now that they've got their SOC 2 and, and things like that. Um, but even the SOC standards now, thankfully, have developed um, or increased in stringency now where they're looking at third party vendors. Uh, as well, you know, so maybe the MSP is doing a really great job uh, at, at managing their authentication to your network and, and things like that. But you want to make sure that the tools and the products that they're using to do the work that they do for you, uh, that those companies have all of their internal controls and, and security controls in place. So and that's that's by reading a SOC 2, right? <laughs> 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 and and that, I mean, I mean, uh, I tell people that if you want a cure for insomnia, just read a SOC too. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you know, it's the, the thing is, it's, it's so much better than nothing, you know? Yeah, it's, it, it's uh... no, and I'm not I, I, I joke about it, but I'm not uh, I'm not I'm not saying anything negative. I don't want to give that impression about the SOC 2. In fact, I encourage folks to review them more and to understand the different parts of it, including the uh, complementary user entity controls, which are things that you need to do um, as the as the consumer of that. But that kind of brings up another question in my mind, and it just came into my mind. It, typically, I haven't seen MSPs in the past, or at least a lot of them, particularly the smaller ones, going down the path of getting a SOC 2 for their organization. But I get the sense that that's changing. Have you seen that in, in your space? It is changing. I think that you're starting to see, uh, I mean, almost all of the ones, the larger ones, you know, 50 to 100 employee MSPs, they almost all have it. Uh, and it's being driven by uh, all of the different requirements, whether it's FFIC, you know, guidance and in, in financial institutions uh, or CGIS or FedRAMP, whatever whatever space vertical niche the uh, the MSP is working in, those different things are, are driving that. Um, but, uh, you know, in the, in the small MSP space, uh, which here in the Nashville market, there, there's dozens of them. And uh, I still see that a lot of them, uh, you know, the experience, let's say you're a client of one of these MSPs, your experience is going to be these guys are great because you call their help desk and everybody's friendly and they seem your stuff seems to be always running. Uh, and it's still kind of that uptime as being the, the measure of success. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you, when you, uh, you know, pull the curtain back at how that MSP is operating, they're still using uh, shared credentials for administrative access to servers and potentially still have uh, using RDP on occasion to remotely access things and stuff that, that you see it and you're like, ah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, when you yeah. said RDP, that was what was yeah. in my You're mind. Like, ah, you can't like, do that. No, I, I got to maintain a stoic face here, and yeah. you know, but uh, it it is unfortunate. I, I that that RDP is still so prolific out there without any sort of additional controls on it. I mean, if you do RDP, 
with a different VPN and limit your access, that's what, that's fine. You know, we always talk about layered security and layered controls, which then brings me to the next thing that just came into my mind, talking about ConnectWise, the Fortify, um, I guess you call it a cybersecurity stack. Can you talk a little bit more about what ConnectWise actually offers? The reason why I ask is that I, I just love hearing about different tools. And I don't think I'm the only one who loves hearing about that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so I went in and it's, it'll be interesting. I think in the next coming months, we're uh, there's going to be a new rebranding uh, of the ConnectWise security stack to sort of make it more easy to see, more easy to understand when you look at it on our website, what each and every little component of it is. Uh, but in particular, I'm working with MSPs that have joined this, our cybersecurity partner program, which is, it's a... Uh, it has many, many benefits to it, but it's it's for MSPs that have made a concerted effort. We're going to allocate resources financially from a you know a talent standpoint to really launch a cybersecurity program and and move forward with it. And so, from a ConnectWise standpoint, we are providing to them uh, a variety of tools. We're providing them tools to do uh, you know basic risk assessments uh, where you sit through and and uh, you know talk to them, whether it's a HIPAA-oriented one or PCI-oriented one, things like that. Uh, we have a product that allows them to do um, some vulnerability uh, management, vulnerability assessment type stuff. Um, not, you know, not anything that replaces the third-party uh, assessments and, and testing that you should be doing, uh, but the stuff that people should be doing on an ongoing basis to make sure that, that everything is good, dark web scanning, all of that kind of stuff. But then the real, real bread and butter is... Um, we have got uh, partnerships with Bitdefender and Sentinel One providing uh, an EDR solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also uh, ConnectWise has acquired Perch, uh, which is a, a pretty fantastic SIM solution. So for sort of those three products, uh, we have an over 200 employee SOC now. So we provide SOC backed versions of those three solutions uh, to, to our MSP partners because we found uh, that you know, on average, it costs between one and a half to two million dollars to properly imp implement a security operations center, mm -hmm. um, which is outside the realm of possibility for really most even in-house IT departments, but especially for most small MSPs. And uh, it's it's been interesting. One of the biggest challenges for MSPs in the market right now is availability of talent and, yes. uh, and, the, and how expensive that talent is. And so as you're trying to recruit folks to your to to come work for you uh nobody wants to hear you're going to be working third shift and staring at a screen monitoring alerts uh all night long so uh it makes a lot of sense to outsource some of those components uh to to a sock like ConnectWise or to to someone similar uh to provide those kinds of, of services and, and work in tandem with your team I totally forgot that ConnectWise purchased Perch. Uh, I've been involved with Perch. Um, I know that they're, I could be wrong, but I think that they were pretty heavy in the financial services sector. It, it, is that, does ConnectWise, are you focused more on financial services or really just anybody, any sector? Uh, yeah, on the SIM side of the house with, with Perch, uh, we're pretty heavy in financial services just because of the regulatory requirement to have that sort of, of capability. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also very popular in, in, in other you know, industries as well, healthcare and, uh, and uh, you know, education. Um, but it's uh, the, the thing I think that, that's special about Perch and the reason that it was attractive to ConnectWise, because obviously we worked, we work with MSPs, uh, it was one of those ones that was um, uh, you know, I would say that there's, that there's always solutions that have more bells and whistles and, uh, maybe more features and functionality. Uh, but Perch was a great, great solution and it was designed from the ground up to be multi-tenant in nature. So, uh, if you're like an MSP, an organization that supports, uh, many, many different clients, but needs to, uh, see that through a single pane of glass, uh, with all of the, you know, security, uh, division of, uh, of, of, of responsibility there inside the portal and everything. It does a great job at that. I know too, that uh, it seems like one thing that's becoming more and more prevalent is uh, the, the dawn or the expansion of CMMC in the, in the federal space. Um, that's kind of on my mind. Cause I just went through and did the, uh, the registered practitioner training and 
while I know that not other requirements are in place yet, um, do you, is there, do you know if there's any specific requirements for MSPs in the CMMC space if, if their clients are dealing with um, uh, CUI, uh, classified uncontrolled information, even if they don't actually have access to that information? Uh, I think it varies. I am not intimately aware. Uh, I'm not intimately familiar with there's there's several different layers of CMMC, different mm -hmm. categories, depending on uh, your your access to classified information. Uh, and I'm not uh, intimately familiar with uh, how those different levels affect things. But I do know, for example, uh, that at the highest levels, one of the requirements uh, is that uh, the folks in your SOC or the folks that are that are dealing with your network uh, be onshore and U.S. citizens. Uh, so connect, connect wise, our SOC today is global in nature. So we've got a huge presence here in the United States, but we do have people overseas. So at the very highest levels of CMMC, we're not compliant. Uh, as of today, we will have a U.S. based 100 uh, percent uh, option that will be priced a little bit differently. Uh, here in the coming months. But uh, today, that's a challenge and something that folks should look at. And I know as a, a former bank CISO and uh, working with several financial institutions now that uh, that's always a big thing in financial services space as well. Um, InfoSec and IT, obviously, there's, there's a lot of stress involved with it. And so I'm going to ask a, a couple of questions related to that. The first <laughs> is, uh, why do you do what you do? I mean, why would somebody want to bring themselves into this into this field of high stress? It is stressful, and it's uh, you know, and, and you, I'm sure you've experienced it. It's, it's oftentimes the efforts that we put forth to try to help people do things better feels unappreciated, uh, and it's almost like they're annoying. We're just you know, we're pestering them, trying to get them to do things that they don't want to do. Um, I just think it's rewarding. I think we're. Uh, Oftentimes, IT in general is kind of a thankless business. A lot of the people that, that go out th through their day and doing what they do are unaware of all of the back office IT things that, are, that make their lives possible. Um, and having been in IT for a long time, it, it's, it can feel like you're, you're, you're not making a, a real difference in people's day-to-day -day lives because your work is, uh, it doesn't go seen. Uh, but I think in the cybersecurity space, when you see... Uh, businesses or you hear of them or you know them that have had to pay a, a, a ransom uh, because they got ransomware and their backups weren't good or maybe their backups got encrypted too. Um, is That's what I find rewarding. And then particularly in the, in the role I'm in now working with the MSPs uh, and just knowing how difficult it is to do cybersecurity well as an MSP and, uh, and having the tools to, to, to help those folks uh, do a better job of it. You bring up a great point about not being seen. I, I know that it seems like that in IT, and it's true with InfoSec as well, but IT is only seen as something bad happens, right. if something goes down. And, and back in my former life, um, I, I grew up in the networking space, if you will. And it seemed like that whenever something was wrong, it was always the network, always the network. And I'd spend a significant time with the rest of my IT staff the, my coworkers, not that they were working for me, but in other departments explaining, no, this is all fine. Here's the server response, a very stressful thing there as well. And, and so one of the things that I used to do to counter stress is uh, I remember being at uh, Middle Tennessee State University is that at lunchtime, I'd go play racquetball. So that was one of the things, a physical activity that helped me with stress. What are some of the things that you do to help you decompress and, and deal with stress? Yes. So to, uh, the biggest thing for me, uh, I tend to be a pretty anxious person um, is, is I love to run uh, and I'm not a I'm not a huge runner. You know, I run 25, 30 miles a week. Um, and uh, oh, that's and my, not huge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a super fast runner either. Was, <laughs> you know, as you get more into the running community, you realize there, there's people out there that run like 50 miles a week. It's crazy. I know. That's amazing. Um, but I, I like to run and it's interesting. I've been running pretty seriously for six or seven years. And it's uh, it really started because I also really enjoy backpacking and hiking. Mm -hmm. um, and as I developed in that, it was starting to plan uh, more difficult and uh, just uh, more rigorous adventures. Uh, I found that that the running uh, got me in the kind of shape that I needed to be in to go enjoy those sorts of things. Uh, and really, at some point, I guess in the last two years, I still do a lot of backpacking and hiking. Uh, but I think the running may have uh, 
uh, my drive to be more competitive there has has maybe surpassed my hiking as far as uh, where I put my efforts. Competitiveness and running, go figure. And uh, I just yesterday signed up, or the day before, I think it opened up, signed up for um, the um, in Murfreesboro every year, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. They do the uh, the middle half because Murfreesboro is in the middle of the state of Tennessee, and I have done that run every year since its inception, including the virtual when, when it was not in place for COVID. So this will be my 15th. And the last that I saw, I think, I know at the 10th, there was 32 of us that had done every one. And oh, that's wow. not the case now. So my talking <laughs> about being competitive, my goal is to be the last one standing. So I'm hoping, hopefully this year I get to find out. I'm guessing it's probably under 20 at this point in time. So well, that, that's that's exciting. I, I should take a look at that race. I just ran my first sub uh, two hour half marathon uh, the other day. Oh, my which, gosh. That's awesome. Which, which I was like, I said, See, that's not that fast. But uh, it's, no, it's- no, no, that's huge. I mean, I I, I hadn't been able to do a, a two hour a sub two in, in six years. And I did a lot of training um, to try to get back to that point. And last year I did break it. It's probably the last time I'm going to break it. I mean, I'm, I'm significantly older than you and things tend to break down as you do more of this stuff, but that's awesome. I mean, there are very few people that can say that they can run a sub two half. So, well, James, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on. I I just, I love your story. I love hearing about, um, what you're all are doing and particularly what drives you in this space and everything. And so if, uh, for folks that are interested in, uh, connect wise, um, uh, website for ConnectWise? What's the website? It's ConnectWise.com. Well, that's really hard to remember. So, <laughs> well, I appreciate you joining us. Um, and for everybody else, stay secure. <laughs>